Congratulations, you made it to the Xville. You can relax, empty your bags, and we hope you enjoy the show. Hey there, Mike, a.k.a. MTB Trigger here, and with me as always is my co-host Ronald, a.k.a. Eric. If you are brand new, welcome. This is an Escape from Tarkov podcast where we talk about all things EFT, and our goal is to get better at the game, and we hope you come along with us on that journey. We are now firmly into the pre-12.6 wipe period, and since we don't know exactly what's coming, so we just decided that we'd bring another guest on because we don't know when it's coming. We don't know what's coming. So we thought we'd reach out to somebody and do another guest episode. But first, let's get our hideout keeping out of the way. The first and best way that you can help us out on the show is to share the podcast with a friend, whether they're new to the game, whether they're thinking about the game. It doesn't matter. That's the best thing that you can do for us. Second to that is giving us a rating, a like, a comment on any podcast platform that you can. And then always, if you listen to the episode multiple times, we thank you for those of you that do. If you can do one of those on a YouTube browser, even if you open it up on another monitor and just listen to it, helps us out tremendously over there as well. But that's it. We're going to jump right into this one this week. So for me, you can find me a couple days a week on Twitch. I'm also on Twitter and Instagram at MTB Trigger. And yeah, Ronald, let these fine folks know how you're doing, what's going on, and uh, let them know who's on the show with us this week. Hey, what's up, everybody? Uh, the best way to get in touch with me is always on the Xfield Discord. Go ahead and send me a DM there. We're always happy to talk to everybody in the Xfield community. And as always, you can get me on the Twitters at Ronald Gaming. You can follow the show at XFIL Podcast. And also, if there's something you don't want to send through Discord, you can email the show at xpmedia2020 at gmail.com. That's the official contact point for the XFIL Podcast. And finally, be sure to check out the website at xpmedianow.com. Look for blog entries and other interesting new content to be posted there on a regular basis. But We're done with that for now. Tonight on the show, we have a guest. Some of you have probably chatted with him in the Excel Discord before because he posts his loot in the loot page pretty regularly. He's the founder of a globally recognized and touring band, The Lumineers. And if that doesn't ring a bell, maybe the song Hohe or Ophelia does. He has a large following on Instagram and Twitter and even streams a few days a week on Twitch but most recently partnered up with Razor and has some really neat content coming out as a result of that. And we've had the pleasure of even playing with him from time to time. Jeremiah Freights, Jer, welcome to the show, sir. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me, guys. Awesome, man. And I mean, Ronald kind of alluded to it, man. And I know that uh, you're not on tour right now. And when you're not on tour, you're generally finding some time to jump in and and play some games, and we've had the pleasure to do that for the last few weeks. Um, but it was about six months ago when you and I were both pretty heavy into PUBG, and we had that conversation of you were going on a pretty long stretch of your world tour. We needed to get some games in because there was about to be a very long stretch where you didn't think you were going to even get to game. And now we're in this sort of quarantine or lockdown, which really affects everyone. And personally, it sits kind of weird with me related to you, because over the past few weeks, we've got to play some games and get into labs. And uh, I sincerely enjoy that time. But that means that you're not on tour. So can you talk about that a little bit? Because, again, I'm torn on it because I know how important your music is to you. But I also know that that, you know, you get to game. So it's a it's an interesting dynamic. Yeah, it's been interesting to say the least. I mean, I think everybody's got their own situation to gripe about and their own hardship that they're experiencing. For me, with regards to touring, yeah, that's true. We had a you know massive kind of two-year tour booked. Um, we were 
pretty much at the start of it. We we went out um, middle of January. We started out in Los Angeles and started playing around the United States and Canada. And yeah, we had a, just a beautiful tour. You know, for 2020, we were going to go to South America and Asia, back to Europe, um, hit the United States very heavily. And, uh, you know, in a very short period of time, kind of like it just disappeared into thin air. And like I said, everybody's going through some some really hard times in their own way. And at the end of the day, I can't complain too much. Um, I do complain from time to time. But um, when all is said and done, you know, the tour, um, at some point, you know, things will resume. And things will, I like to think of it as no, nothing's being canceled, but more a postponing of these shows. So I'm really eager to get back out there. But at the same time, like you said, I'm trying to make the most of it. You know, I'm getting more at home time, more family time. And, uh, yeah, when everybody goes to sleep, I like to throw down on some games at night uh, pretty regularly. So I'm trying to make the best of it, you know. Have Has this been one of the longer, if not the longest, stretches of quote-unquote home time that you've had in the last few years? Yeah, it's been, I mean, when we're not touring, um, when, a, when a tour cycle is done, we do have time at home. But this is a very specific way to be home where... um you know, you can't really do anything normal, obviously. So I don't remember the last time I've been home yeah, this much, but it's a very strange being at home. It's the atypical being at home. And, um, but like I said, I'm trying to make the most of it. And I've been trying to actually record some solo piano music, which has been difficult at times because I have to, you know, when you go into a studio, they have soundproof walls and whatnot here in a house. Um, you know, there's construction around and there's cars driving by and there's airplanes overhead and whatever. So it's been challenging. And I find generally not just with the recording, um, what normally took one day now takes three or four, sometimes five. And it's very frustrating. I kind of equate it to, um, so I've been trying to record and I feel like I equate that to, um, if I were making an ice sculpture, uh, once a day, I walk up to the ice, ice sculpture and I kind of take a whack at it. And sometimes that one whack is not the one that you intended. And then that's like kind of your one thing you can do. And every day I look at this ice sculpture and I'm like, man, that still doesn't really look like an ice sculpture. But ideally one day it's going to look like something. But um, for someone like me, I I have uh, very little patience in general. So it's been very uh, difficult acclimating to this new kind of reality. I I guess I find that really interesting, right? And we had... um... We had Veritas on the show, uh, who's a pretty big content creator for Tarkov, but he's also uh, produces some music of his own. And he sort of talked about this concept that sort of relates to what you just said about the ice sculpture, but it's kind of like, he would say, you know, you kind of create this thing over time and you add something and you take something away, you modify it. And then in, in his mind, it was you experienced this piece in his mind all the way through, but then other people kind of take it and experience it completely differently. With with this, your solo album, I guess I'm assuming this, but I'm assuming it's going to be all piano. But do you find that like you'll write something and you maybe you don't think it's quite done or to your point, you took a whack at it and someone's like, that's perfect. And you're like, ooh, yeah, no, that's not anywhere close to where it's going to end up. No, it's a great question. I mean, t- sometimes you think you make the most miraculous, genius, you know, stroke, and you're like, this is going to blow people's minds. And then you show it to somebody, and they're like, yeah, that was cool. And then sometimes you do something very quick, you do something hastily, you don't really think too much about what you're doing, and you kind of ignore it. And then somebody shows, eventually hears it, or you show it to them inadvertently, or they overhear something, and they're like, what's that? And I think psychologically, too, there's something interesting. I think if you were to tell a friend, hey, watch this movie. It's the best movie you'll ever see in your entire life. um, That sets a ridiculously high bar. So I think there's something to that. Like, I think when you make something that you think is incredible, you subconsciously or you you actually put that energy out to the person that turns them off. And I think sometimes if you, you know, that idea of inception, if if somebody feels like they're discovering the idea for themselves, whether that's music or whatever have you, um, it's going to be probably 10 times more potent and powerful in their mind. So it has been tricky, though. I mean, there's a a solo album. It's mostly piano. There's definitely going to be some kind of strings and some other sounds and whatnot, but it's a a new new frontier for me. It's kind of been in the making kind of for the last 10 years. You know, I've been 
there's some pieces that are very old and um at the end of the day i'm just trying to make something that sounds very raw and vulnerable and um it's a good time to do it too i mean it's a very strange time right now that we're all going through so i find that when i think i come up with a good idea or i record something that i think or know to be a good idea it's very exciting and then you know the majority of the day though is sort of like trying to be your own best cheerleader trying to be mr optimistic trying not to fall into a pattern of well this situation sucks whatever have you so it's it's not all it's not easy um i don't think anybody's having an easy time for that matter i don't want to just be the only one saying like oh woe is me i'm not on tour um i know people have very you know much bigger problems in their life so i just hope everybody's doing okay and uh for someone like me again i'm just trying to you know keep myself stimulated and make the most of it, whether it's with trying to work in a very strange way or with family or whatever. Yeah. And I think that's the, the most interesting part for me is just getting to know a little bit about your world. Right. Cause when we spoke the last time and, and to preface this a little bit, for those of you that um, are just hearing from Jeremiah or Jer, as we like to call him, um, we actually had him on the Winner Winner podcast, which is the PUBG podcast uh, that I also host. And we did a much uh, deeper dive on gaming um, and some other stuff over there. So I'll plug that right now and just say, hey, if you want some more info on Jer and some more background info, we're definitely going to get, you're definitely going to get that over on the Winner Winner podcast. And we'll link that in the show notes and in the description and everything there. But the reason I bring that up is, you know, I think. I agree. Everybody has been affected by this differently. And one of the things that I've always appreciated about uh, you specifically is that you're really open about the things that are, I guess the word I would use is frustrating, but I think you maybe would use the word distracting. But I'll never forget when you first told me about the, you know, the Wi-Fi issues that you would encounter at, you know, the hotels that you guys would stay at trying to get online to play games. And then just to hear you talk about how you're recording at home because you can't go to the studio and you're talking about car noise and airplane noise. And if you're anything like Eric or I, it's probably family distraction as well can really interrupt the workflow during this time. So it's it's interesting to me how I don't really think about how production heavy music is and how important the silence or the noise reduced studio is to what you do so i mean how have you adapted to that in this current situation it's been tough i'm not gonna lie um sometimes the sounds that happen the sounds that occur um can be very cool i have a song i have one song that i've released um as solo jeremiah freights and it's on spotify and all the other streaming and it's just called 11 Shapes. Now, that is a song, uh, believe it or not, I recorded with my iPhone in Torino, Italy, um, at least a few years ago at this point. Uh, my wife was working at the time, so I was just kind of chugging espresso all day in Italy and playing on this piano. We were actually staying at an Airbnb in Torino, Italy, and there was a beautiful piano there. So I was writing constantly, and it was a very, very um, productive it was a crazy like four or five days in a row, just con- like so much stuff and so much content was coming out of me. There was something about this piano at this Airbnb and that song, 11 Shapes, um, if you listen to it, it, there's a lot of noise, but also the door was open and it was raining. And there's something about that that I love that. I love listening to that and remembering the rain. And it takes me, it's almost like a diary or like a quick snapshot where it not only I can remember the place, but I can remember the rain and this or that. Now, sometimes you're doing, just the other day, I was doing a piano take and, you know, somebody sped down the street. That's not a sick sound. That's not a beautiful sound. (laughs) It sounded like a low bass note. It made it sound terrible. And that's, uh, you know, so there's things sometimes where like a plane flies overhead and it's kind of like, and then that's a philosophical debate where you're like, that's cool. Is that cool? Yeah, that's cool. But is that cool? Like, it, it's one of those things, too, where you have to remember your audience or your, your fan base or people that don't know who you are to your music, they might listen to that and be like, either, wow, that's cool that this guy left that in there, or like, wow, this guy doesn't know how to record. He's an idiot. And that's a big philosophical thing we get into a lot, whether it's with 
you know, within my own head about my music or all the time with the Lumineers music about, you know, oh, this happened or your, your button hit the string when you were strumming the guitar. No, no, that's cool. That sounds, you know, so it's been a trying, uh, it's been very difficult and it's, there's been some moments where it's been just like, this is insane. And, uh, there was a couple moments where I stopped and I said, I'm not going to do this right now. I'm going to wait, whether it's six months or six years until the world gets back to normal, I'm going to go into a studio. And then just the other day, I finally got like a recording of a piano that I really fell in love with and it all just evaporated. And now I still have normal hardships, but it was like, it was slowly building up where I was like, um, you know, this idea I thought I had that was so great. I'm going to be so productive during this time and I'm going to record this album. When I started to see that possibly slip away through just um, noise and not being, I don't live in a soundproof studio. Obviously I live in a house. <laughs> so uh, right. now that that's returning, it's been, it's been really positive and it's been something that I think has been really helping me. And like, honestly, like a spiritual level, like it's something that I'm chipping away at and it's been, very positive for me. That's pretty cool. I was sitting here kind of listening to you describe the the process and you kind of answered the question that was kind of coming up to my mind, but I kind of want to ask this in a different way too, is how this time period is affecting the uniqueness of the music that you're writing, you know, because all these different inputs and influences right now are probably different than that very structured in the studio you know, everything is kind of set up and sterile to get going. But now you've got all these other, some would call them distractions. But I mean, in the creative process, do you find that it just gets you going in a different direction? Yeah, I mean, I think it'd be weird if it if it didn't affect me. Um, it's weird, too, because typically you write everything. Ideally, you write a bunch of stuff and then you're like, OK, now it's time to I'm going to spend a lot of money and go into a studio and this stuff is like mostly written. That's the way I like to work. And that's the way we work with the band. Um, 80 to 90% of the stuff is like pretty much written and we're going to go execute. It's not so much. Let's like go in the studio and drink tea and vibe out. It's like, let's go execute what we think is good. Um, and this environment has been very, very strange and interesting and frustrating and everything in between where um, if I play the piano um, our dog Spaghetti, that's his name, he's a golden retriever. Our dog Spaghetti likes to try to, I don't know what, I don't know what it is since he was a puppy, he's five years old. He's trying to like howl at the, the notes I'm hitting or he's trying to harmonize or I don't know what the hell he's doing, but he just makes a lot of noise and it's kind of cute. But when you're actually trying to record, it's obviously frustrating. Um, we also have a, a two-year-old son, <laughs> anybody that's a father or mother knows that two-year-olds are very <laughs> excited and, uh, you know, they're always running around. So for me, it's this thing where in the middle of the day, um, that's when, when my son is taking his nap, uh, that's actually when I try to record some of these song ideas. And, you know, I have anywhere between one hour, to, you know, a couple hours, depending on his nap, to try to record this. And typically when you're in a studio, you know, you can go 10, 12, 14, 16 hour days because it's designed to be essentially soundproof and you're just, you're left to record until you get burned out. This, on the other hand, is very different because it's scheduled. I have to wait till he goes to sleep. And then it's like, okay, you have the, 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 the imaginary slash actual countdown has begun. And the first time I tried to record, I, I just was sort of in a whirlwind of like anxiety and I hated it because I just kept thinking like, okay, I'm going to have to stop recording soon. And now I've got, now it's gotten better, but I think too, like when, it, by the time I can actually set up and start to record and I put the headphones on and I hear silence, it's, it's pretty, it's, it's like mesmerizing that silence. And it's very exciting because I think in some weird way, I think I took that for granted that normally I could go to a studio and it would just be silent and then you would make the sound. But trying to do this from my home, there's constant sound. Anybody that's a parent, you know, of any, any age, child, or children, animals in the house, whatever have you, um, there's constant sound, constant movement, constant sound. And uh, when everything's quiet and I know it's temporary, it gives me this sense of, okay, dude, you really got to kind of get your stuff together. You really got to like record. There's no excuses because 
you don't have 10 hours, you don't have 14 hours, you have two hours. And if you miss that, you're going to have to wait till tomorrow. And, you know, you might even do or take and a car or the garbage truck might drive by or a reminder will go off my phone and something, you know, who knows, like just stupid stuff will get in the way of the recording. So um, it's been pretty wild. I think though, through all this, once it's done, I think it's going to turn out great. I think there's going to be memories to last a lifetime. Um, the thing I'm trying to avoid is that I don't want this album just to be cool because Yo, he recorded it during pandemic 2020. Maybe in the interim, people might jump on that and be like, that's cool. He did it during the pandemic. But, you know, in five, 10 years, I want people to be like, that was cool music. So it's, it's at first, it was very easy to get into like, well, I'll just record it. It'll be lo-fi, but people will get it because it's like it was recorded during this very strange, unprecedented time. And, you know, for the rest of our lives, for the rest of our children's lives, people will talk about this time period like a hundred percent. So there will be that factor, but I was like, I don't want to just record something that was cool because I did it during this time. I want it to stand on its own two feet. So, um, yeah, I probably spent close to seven to 10 days just to get the grand piano the way I wanted it to sound. Um, you know, I got some new mics. Oh, the new mics, they need a stand. That's another two or three days lost. The stand comes. Oh, okay. Well, Apple, you know, changes all their ports. I need a new Thunderbolt 2 that converts to Thunderbolt C. That's another two days gone. Um, and you know, this stuff, I could go to Best Buy or Guitar Center and knock it out. Like I literally probably lost about 10 days of just, you know, the new reality that we're living in and trying to do something I've never done before. I'm working with an engineer remotely in New York State. Um, so we'd like FaceTime and I, I would record some piano, send him the session. He would listen to it and be like, you know, it sounds out of phase, which is some deep science that the, when you record mics, they got to be in phase. And I don't know. Um, so yeah, it's been a crazy, but crazy experience, no doubt, but I've learned a lot. I think I've learned that, um, it's a good lesson too, you know, besides music, it's just like, you, you can't always get the things you want. You can't always get it your way. And, uh, even though I would prefer to have it my way and record the way I'm used to recording, but I think in some weird way, it's going to turn out great. And I don't know if it's going to turn out better or worse than other recordings I would have done. I think it's going to turn out the way it was meant to be. And, uh, I think these memories are, are hard to understand, you know, now, but I think when a year, two, five years pass, I'll look back. It's going to be very beautiful remembering, like, you know, knowing that when I recorded, my son was upstairs sleeping, or there's already a song I recorded where there's an airplane flying overhead. And it's, it's just a cool thing back to the 11 shapes with the rain outside where it's like, I will remember that having the window open and that there was somebody flying above my house, you know, thousands of feet and I don't know. I don't want to get too artsy fartsy, but there's something philosophical about if that stuff can make it to the record and not get in the way, but actually add to it in some way. And again, it's a big philosophical debate. You'll, you'll talk to people that say, you know, let's record everything high def and it's got to be high def and you got to clean up all the sound and all the noise. And then there's other people that at the other end of the spectrum. And I think neither I, I agree with, I think whatever makes sense, makes sense for the record. So yeah, it's a big tangent, but uh, yeah. No, but it, it, we we go back and forth on that all the time, right? And just for the podcast or the YouTube or whatever, and just like, should we go do the 4K or would 1080 be okay? Or should we mute these sections? Should we boost the game? All these things. And I guess one of the things that I've really come to appreciate about hearing this is like, for one, it'll be cool to actually hear that when it comes out, right? And and to see if it's there and anyone that hears this is going to hear that as well. But it's that, it's kind of that backstory. And I guess this this may seem like a rough transition, but it's something that um, I, I don't want to necessarily dig into the topic. And you're going to hear me plug quite a few things that Jer has done or is doing. And I'm going to encourage him to keep talking about these things because I think they're really cool. But the same thread of production or should it be perfect was something that I heard. Uh, you did a podcast called The Last Day. 
and and I'm actually going to let you explain what it is, but you allowed something to happen on that podcast with your mom and uh, having a, a recorded phone call that was so raw and not perfect. You know, it was a phone call for crying out loud, but but there was something to it and letting people in and hearing the background, hearing the question um, that you just kind of let people in. So I guess my my question to you is, for one, the the whole situation, and again, I'm going to let you explain it because sure. you, you even said it on that podcast, um, how when someone asks you about this situation, you're not prepared for it. It's there's no way to possibly get into it in depth, just us talking tonight, but that rawness and letting people in and that imperfection of a phone call on a podcast, like how did that all tie together? Because I'll, I'll be honest, man, I was walking my dog and that when that happened, I had to stop because <laughs> it was like, oh my gosh, this is about to get real. So can can you talk yeah, about sure. that a little bit? Yeah. So might've been a month ago weeks ago for sure um i did a podcast called the last day and essentially the two hosts of the show um they both lost their brothers to um opioid and heroin i think overdoses in both their uh situations and um they reached out to me because i have unfortunately um you know we have that in common my older brother he died of a heroin uh, drug overdose in 2001, so almost 20 years ago. And at first I was really gung-ho about doing it because I felt like it was, um, I just felt like a good fit to go there. And then the day I actually told uh, the host who I talked with, um, I told her the day, the morning of, I woke up and it was just dreading it. And, um, you know, it sort of delves into the last, your recollection of the last day of the person in question of, you know, their last day on earth, the last day they were alive, which is, um, extremely heavy, but I think it's extremely uh, interesting and profound too. I think it also helps that both hosts have lost somebody um, immensely close to them. I think if they hadn't, they wouldn't have the sort of street cred or whatever you want to call it, like the the key card to sort of uh, not make it exploited, like exploitative, whatever that word is, not exploit yeah. it. Like, hey, let's just talk about some dark stuff. And, you know, um, but it was really cool to do it at the end of the day. And yeah, having my mom on the phone, um, that was something we talked about too, where we could have gone to a studio, but then this Corona uh, situation snowballed. So I was able to record myself high def because I have a studio at my house essentially. But um, yeah, we, I, I, th I actually said to the host, I said, you know what, let's leave my mom as sort of the cell phone caller. And I think sometimes when you watch these um, great documentaries that blow people's minds, whether it's visual mostly on Netflix or it's a podcast. Um, you know, you'll hear like that phone call from the inmate at the jail cell and they'll leave it kind of grimy. And that's, it's just kind of cool. It dates it, it places it, the, the mood um, gets contextualized. Cause it'd be weird if somebody was calling in from a jail cell and their voice was super high def and you'd be like, wait, that doesn't make any sense. Wouldn't feel as vulnerable, but um, yeah. So I did that podcast and it came out and uh, I think a lot of people responded to it. And, you know, a lot of people have that in common, unfortunately. And I think for me, like almost to tie it to gaming in a, in a roundabout way, um, it's been cool because, you know, when you play the game, whether it's Tarkov, whether it's PUBG, whether, whatever it is, there's those loading screens, there's those menus, there's those, the game is starting up or the game is turning off and you're shutting down the stream or whatever. And you're just talking to the people and, you know, sometimes you play with people and 98% of it is about the game. And sometimes you talk to people and you get into stuff. And I think that's what's been really cool about, you know, like I don't, I'm not really like a variety gamer. I find a game and I get like very, very into it. And that happened with PUBG. And now I'm currently in that with Tarkov where um, it's been so much fun to like sink my teeth into. But I think it's cool too to like, you know, the gaming sometimes is not just the main focus. It's, it's the social aspect. It's meeting people, whether it's very, um, you know, like at arm's reach just in the chat of your Twitch stream or whether it's like, Hey, hop in the discord channel and interacting and engaging with people and getting to know them. Um, it's been really cool in that regard. And um, yeah, I don't know. Well, and that social aspect is definitely interesting because uh, just in the past few months, I mean, you've done a couple things like teach piano or, just gotten on your stream and then chatted with people and 
and showed them around your your studio office and, and all your various instruments and some of the story behind them and then you would play some requests and then you did some more formal piano teaching but then on your twitch you also do things like just game right and um, we've played together on the stream and you you've played with some other content creators so how is your mindset different like is it different when you're going on to you know communicate with maybe fans of your music versus fans of just you and your gaming um do you find it's kind of the same mentality or do you have to prepare differently to do that so when I first started streaming, um, it was very strange for me and it was very kind of awkward and I didn't really know how to, I also was on a 15 inch laptop on tour with hotel Wi-Fi, So it was quite difficult to even get the stream up and running, uh, most days, let alone have like high octane playing and then engage with chat. And I also had to like, I only had the 15 inch monitor. So that would be for the game, obviously. And then I either have an iPad or a phone on the side to look at chat. And I just didn't really get it. I didn't really know how to do it. And I still am kind of, you know, walking or crawling for that matter with the, with the stream. But like you said, I did a few, I did a handful of piano tutorials of Lumineer songs and kind of, that was really easy because it was something I know so well. I mean, it would be like, you know, somebody like Chaco Taco talking about PUBG or Pastilli talking about, Tarkov. It's just it's so second nature. Um, they have so many hours in it. They just know it so well. And it's like talking about, you know, their best friend in the whole world or something. My relationship with music is the same way. I mean, it's just very easy to engage and talk about it and keep it going. When I'm playing a game, you know, I'm not like a crazy gamer. I'm not like shroud level where I'm going to just go in and like smoke the whole server and extract with 6 million in loot and all this stuff. So I'm aware of that. I think my chat and the people that come in are aware of that. Uh, thankfully, I've never been trolled or had any like neg- you know, negative. I've had a few comments every now and then, and I've only banned probably one or two people. <laughs> so that's pretty good numbers, I'd, I'd say. Good. Yeah. Um, but most of the, for the most part, it's been really fun, and I think um, it really, I think I fell in love with it more, even on tour because um, I was finding like we just were getting lucky with hotels, and uh, I was finding like if I was proactive, I could eventually get the IT person at the hotel to set up the Ethernet which is always like the first like 15 to 45 minute phone call I do when I like, before I even put my bags down, I'm like, Hey, I need to talk to your IT person and open up ethernet port next to like the microwave or whatever. Um, so I was pretty hardcore about getting that stuff done just to game, even if it was like for an hour or whatever, if it was in Nashville, Tennessee or Tokyo, Japan, wherever it was, it was just trying to get the game going pretty much. Cause you know, especially when I'm by myself, if I'm out with my family, my wife and son that is uh it's different you know i'm gonna game way less if at all so um but yeah i forget um i've lost my train of thought no worries i i was really just hoping to draw that kind of correlation or lack thereof of the difference between you um streaming gaming and piano and and i guess the the event that that's sticking out in my mind is actually something that you referenced earlier, which is, you know, kind of the, the rain in the backtrack or now the plane. And I think one of the coolest things that I saw you do on stream was you actually have the piano that you recorded Donna on and you showed and talked about the cloth that I can't remember if it was your dad. I can't remember who it was that helped yeah, my you father make in law. it. Yeah. Father-in-law. Yeah. So you guys made something that produced the unique sound that so many people have connected with through that song. And then you're showing that like <laughs> that on stream that it just kind of came up naturally. It was like, Oh yeah, this is why this sounds this way. <laughs> so it's interesting, you know, going back to, you were talking about whether you want to use 4k or 1080 or whatever you want to use for YouTube or video quality or whatever it might be with, with regards to your content. Um, My biggest, this is my single biggest frustration. When I play with players that I know are much better than me at Tarkov, and when I play with players that I just know have like hundreds, if not thousands of more hours, it doesn't even have to be Tarkov. It's like this with any game. Um, I ask people for advice. What gun should I use or what ammo should I use? The most frustrating answer I can get is something to the effect of, uh, use it's it, it it's totally subjective or it's it's like judicial just oh, well, whatever works for you and i'm like yeah that's great i don't get that that doesn't help tell me like 
tell me like AS Val with the SP6 or whatever. And I guess like with regards to uh, with music, it's the same way where if somebody were to ask me, well, how should I record this piano? I would probably be my own example of frustration where I'd say like, just put some mics up when it sounds good. If it sounds good, don't touch it. And then you're good. And they'd be like, okay, well, where should I literally put the mics? And like, I don't know, just if it sounds good, don't touch it. And with that piano uh, you're talking about with Donna on our, it's the first song that started our new album, Three, that came out in, uh, I guess, September last year. Wow. Um, it was interesting because I wrote this piece of music. Uh, it was just started out as an instrumental before like the melodies and stuff were worked on. And it was recorded. There's a, there's a way to mute a piano and you can buy these pianos that are muted and there's a pedal and it's very easy and it's very like professional. And I, I I looked it up and I think it was like 115 or $130 to buy this kit on Amazon where you get some screws and you put this piece of like felt down in between the hammer and the string. And I was like, that seems like a lot of money to put a piece of felt between hammer and the string. So I went to Joanne Fabrics um, here in Colorado uh, with my father-in-law. And I think I spent literally $3. Like it was like two ninety three, and we got... Um, very big piece of acrylic felt that was like tan and uh we cut 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 it in half and we were able to to mute not one but two pianos for less than three dollars which would have cost almost two hundred three hundred dollars the other way and uh, it gives it this very soft kind of mysterious ghostly sound um it was interesting because you know back to that judicial or back to that just um use your head whether it's what should you use? What should you not use? You really just have to be awake and say, well, this is working or it's not working. And what was so funny about that was I did not follow my own advice. Um, sent the demo and it was on this mel- this muted piano. Uh, me and Wes, the singer, we started working on it in our little practice space and we started to record it. And I took the felt off. and I So now it's just a normal upright piano. And I knew the music was good. I knew the song was going to be cool, but uh, we recorded it that way. And we hit space bar and we we're listening to it. And I'm like, man, why does this song just suck? Like, I don't get this. Why is this, what's missing? And I threw the felt back on and then we both looked at each other and we're like, oh, wow, that's that's so cool. And I was like, I don't know, like, that's how I, that's, that was the inception of the idea. That part was written for that specific octave. It was written for that specific, you know, the felt between the hammer and the string. And uh, I think it was a good lesson. Like, if you're doing something and it's not broken, you know, it's that classic, if it's not broken, don't try to fix it. And again, like, you know, if you're if you're going into Tarkov with a gun that most people question you or they think the gun is not good, but you're doing good with it, then you know, pay no mind. You're you're on the right track, and I think that applies to whatever field or whatever profession you're in. Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting. You know, I can totally relate to the "How should I do this?" question. We we were joking around last week about the Chads and the Brads, and you know, triggers triggers the Chad. He's he's the thousands and thousands of hours FPS guy, but uh, I've I've totally been there, man. Asked that question: What gun should I use? And the, and the answer is always, well, I don't know. I mean, use whatever you're comfortable with. <laughs> and of course, I'm oh, like, man, that's like I feel attacked. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 you're talking about me. <laughs> no, no, no. It, it, it's it, it it's not it's not attack. It's actually an appreciation that you're trying to explain it in a way that's long term going to be helpful right once you get enough hours and over the hump then it finally makes sense and i think i have i don't know how many hours i have two 250 maybe something like that it's finally starting to make sense where i'm like okay it is it's kind of a difficult question but i want to try to not make that mistake with new players um like when they ask i think it's helpful at least at first to be like use this and if you have no money like don't use that expensive ammo or you know just whatever it might be but it's it's a tough um it's a tough, this game is probably tougher than, than other games to answer those seemingly simple questions. Well, and, and this has been a strategy, and, and Eric, you said it there, that you're trying to help someone for the long term related to the way that I teach some things. And it really comes from mistakes that I made early. It comes from mistakes of teaching people early, right? And it's like, I had people give me just like piles of gear at the beginning and and we've talked about this before but it was that fear piece and then i just i didn't want to use this stuff and i didn't want to lose it i didn't know what it was i didn't know what the calibers were but then it's like 
I morphed into saying like, how can I help new people? Because that's really why we created the podcast, why we wanted to create content and help people get good at this game that is not easy. But I, I actually love that concept of like trying to meet someone where they're at and trying to help them. But I'm, I'm just laughing because it's like, in my mind, I'm doing it perfectly by saying, no, just just do what works. Like, no, any any helmet's fine. Like, what do you have, a class four? <laughs> like, yeah, you can put a face shield on it, no big deal. And I, I've never really caught on to that flip side of it that that you on the other side is like, no, literally, like, I don't know what to get. <laughs> and it's it's obviously changed, Jer, um, that, you know, recently it's it's been a little bit different as we've both kind of progressed and started doing labs and stuff. But I can think back to those moments where you've been like, like, hey, what gun should I use? And I'm like, I don't know. What do you got? <laughs> yeah. And it's it's tough, too. I mean, you would be. It would be strange if you if you like if you're a level one and you have like almost no liquid cash and you're like definitely like meta M4 with a Reaper like that's sick. You'd be like, sweet. I like I, I'm not even close to being able to afford that. Why would you tell me that? And then on the flip side, you know, yeah, just saying something wide open like whatever you're comfortable with. And it's like, well, I'm not comfortable with anything. I suck at this game. So I'm just starting out. So it's a, uh, it's a doozy, but I think particularly with this game, I mean, you know, PUBG, you find stuff, you can get stuff, you can tell players what to, to try other games similar, but this game is like, it's, it's so financially driven that it's also, it's difficult to, you know, even I remember like, which backpack should I use? And if you were like, dude, like definitely use a tri zip, like my first week, I'd be like, I don't even know. I don't even think I have enough money to buy that. Or where do you buy that? Is it the, the flea market or, you know, whatever simple questions you start out with. So, yeah. Yeah. There's so much when you start, you know, playing Tarkov. It just, the, 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 how should I do this just kind of really resonated with me because I love how you were tying it back to how you write music and how, how you would explain to someone like how to play a Lumineer song, you know, along those lines, right? It's so natural for you to say, watch my hands and do all these different chords or whatever like that. And, you know, and it's, it's like that, that person may be like, no, like, like tell me the chord or give me the sheet music or something like that. And I was actually thinking about that a little bit because uh, as a piano player myself and kind of a music nerd, I really enjoyed your streams and, and, oh, and, cool. it, Thanks, and, man. Yeah, it totally made me think of like, you know, Trigger saying or or um Dadcaster saying, you know, go go do this when I'm a level one, right? You know, I was like, well, no, no, I actually need to know what parts are on that gun. But kind of relating that all back together, it's it's been a fun journey. And so I think it's just kind of cool to reflect on that with you right now, like how far all of us have kind of come in Tarkov in that way. Oh man, it's uh it's crazy. I mean, I remember the first time I loaded into customs. Uh, the first game I ever played was with um, Reed. His name used to be Chicken of Destiny. Now I think it's just Reed or Reed likes games on Twitch. But he's a great guy. He's a variety streamer. And it was the first game. I think it was a Saturday night in the middle of December. We jumped into customs, and I was just like, "This is insane." There's no compass. There's no map. Even finding good maps at the time on Google, in my experience, was difficult. I was like, "Who made this game?" This is like. The, like the learning curve, like it, it, it was almost as if they didn't want anybody to play their game, which ironically made probably more people interested. And in like, I, you know, I really give them a huge props for testing their audience. It was like, you know what, we're going to make a crossword puzzle and it's going to be super difficult. And that's what we're going to put out every week. There's not going to be any like hints. There's not going to be any clues. And we're just going to see who wants to try to complete this very, very, very difficult crossword puzzle. And I think that they, you know, they, they attracted that sort of, um, that fan base, you know, that's what the people that, you know, play the game for a week or for one hour and they uninstall it. Those are the people that, um, weren't meant to just play this game. And it's a very frustrating game, but you know, it's, it's an, it's an absolutely incredible game. Also, obviously it's more incredible than frustrating. Otherwise I wouldn't continue to play it. So, um, yeah. Well, and you just mentioned the kind of like moment I think everyone experiences when they pick up Tarkov and they're like, this game like literally doesn't help you at all. There's no help. It's, I mean, you're thrown into the <laughs> like zero UI, nothing. There's no map and the maps that are in game are useless. Like the whole bit. 
I, I'm seriously wanting you to back up a little bit and explain like how you got into this game, right? And and was there a, a moment that made you buy the game even or why you got interested in it? And then maybe second to that is what was the moment that hooked you? Because again, I do think Tarkov has that quality to it that people will buy it or try it and play for a week or two weeks and just be like, yep, nope, too hard, need help, would need a compass or whatever else. And that's fine. You want to find something that you're having fun with. But do you also remember the hook that actually got you wanting to get better? So I remember seeing people play this really randomly probably years ago. And, you know, different streamers playing it. And it was not really like, you know, never like was thrusted into the limelight as like the game to play. And it was sort of like, it seemed like this tin, like this peripheral game that some people played a little bit. And then I remember seeing it a little bit more and more um, where people were talking about, you got to build your own gun. And I was like, you got to build your own gun in this game? Like, man, that just seems like just so tedious and not action packed at all. And I thought it was more like you hunt for like berries in a bush and like, you got to build your gun and like, it's super, super slow and like survival, not really PVP. I don't know what I thought, but something along those lines uh, is a pretty accurate picture. And then um, December last year, about five months ago, uh, drops were enabled and it became the biggest game on the planet for at least a couple months, you know, and I saw this guy in Pestilli play in this game that, you know, I think he had like 175,000 concurrent viewers on his stream. And I was like, huh, that's really interesting. That's insane. Let me see. What is this game all about? And then I started talking to a couple of, you know, gamer friends um, just on Discord. Like, hey, do you play Tarkov? Do you like it? And then everybody that responded that affirmed they do play it, they just said they loved it. and um yeah, I was talking to that guy Reed and, you know, me and him used to play a good amount of PUBG and I was like, you know what, if I buy this game, would you like help me? Let's, you know, let's go into it together. And he was like, oh yeah, absolutely. Like, I think he was already level 30 at least. So he had many hours on it and, uh, I splurged with the edge of darkness. I was like, you know, it's almost Christmas time. I'm going to treat myself. And, uh, here we go. I, I, I just had a feeling like that, spending whatever I spent on Edge of Darkness was not going to like be a regrettable purchase. So I got that. And um, I think it just, I don't remember like, you know, maybe something will jog my memory. I don't necessarily remember the most specific moment where I was like hooked. I just remember every gunfight feeling like, like a top 10, if not top five situation in PUBG. It was just so exhilarating to know that that guy that you just shot at that you knew was an enemy looks identical to what you know is your friend walking to your left. You know, like you, you talked about the no, uh, what is it? UI. That's what they call that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Zero UI, the ability that you could always team kill potentially. I mean, even that, like, just think about that subconsciously. You're just going in when you play the game a lot, you're not really worried about that necessarily, but there's subconsciously the whole time you're like, I hope I don't kill my team. Like you just that could happen, you know. And um, I think another aspect about it that I really, you know, hooked me was the idea that when you died, you could lose all your gear. Now there's the insurance program, of course, but the the fact that you could lose that permanently, I think, just really struck me as like, wow, that's a crazy concept. I mean, most games you know, or the opposite of that, the opposite of permanence. It's, it's usually like permanence in the sense that all your stuff is permanent. Um, you know, one of the worst things ever about the resident evil games is that you'd have to, you'd have to find, what was it? An ink ribbon to save. I think to save your game, you have to find an ink ribbon if you're playing on a particular difficulty. And it was like, that was absurd to me. Like you couldn't just save the game. You had to find an ink ribbon and go up to a typewriter and save the game. But it was also something like, this is cool. Like the developers are testing their demographic. They're testing their player base to see if people can like put up with that quote unquote, you know, some games you can just, you can be like mid air and hit like save and then go eat your macaroni and cheese or go out, walk the dog or whatever. Um, Tarkov, I don't know. Just, I think that underlying base of you could lose all your gear. 
you could kill your friend very easily. Um, there's scavs, but then there's player scavs trying to like early on trying to discern between a human and an AI was very challenging. I still find it challenging at times. I've gotten a lot better at it, obviously, but you know, it's still challenging at times. And, um, I don't know. There's just such a, like a methodology or mythology or a lore about this game that is just very deep. And I, I like, you know, obviously I like games that you can sink your teeth into. And I think, uh, this game is, is clearly one of them where, um, every turn that probably should have dissuaded me from furthering my, you know, continuing to play the game. I probably should have uninstalled months ago, but I never did. And I just kept, you know, it was really fun too, being able to talk to people that had many more hours in the game than me. And I think that really brought the game to life. I think if you just were to get this game when the drops were really like, you know, and there's probably going to be an interesting time. I think there's definitely going to be a resurgence coming up in the next couple of weeks or three weeks, whenever this, you know, I don't know when, but whenever this wipe occurs, there's going to be some pre-wipe events, I'm sure, and some craziness. And I'm sure, you know, tens of thousands of people are going to flock back to this game. But, um, yeah, I don't know. It's been a, it's been a very interesting ride. This is, it's probably the most unique experience I've ever had with a game. I can say that for sure. Well, let's, let's talk about the wipe too. Cause I, I love those origin stories, but I also like to hear about like current progress and where you've got right now. So, you know, we're, <clears throat> we don't know if it's next week or three weeks from now or whatever it's going to be, but, we know that the wipe is imminent. That's what we know right now. There's some things that are coming with it that we are aware of, but we alluded to it before that you've been playing in labs. We've done that together. Did you ever imagine yourself getting into the quote-unquote endgame stuff in the first season or wipe? And is there anything else that you're looking to accomplish before having to start over in the next wipe? So the wipe, for me, um, so I bought the game in December, played it a lot in December and January, knew I was going on tour for two months from the middle of January to the middle of March, knew I was not going to be able to get a lot of time on Tarkov. So very early on, I wasn't as committed to tasking as I normally would be. And I was not as, I didn't even know what the hideout was. I never even touched the hideout, like at all, zero. I was like the hideout, it's useless because I'm going to be gone so much. I'm just going to try to pvp task a little bit whatever i thought um i can say that then i kept seeing this word wipe on like message boards and like youtube and twitter comments and i was like what is wipe in the context of escape from tarkov so i looked it up and my heart really like sunk i thought what a i really was bummed at the idea of the wipe at first i thought you're gonna lose all your like your skills all this your guns all your money with this or that now I think it's a really brilliant idea and I'm really looking forward to it. I wish I had started this game years ago, to be honest. Um, I think that going through my first wipe is going to be really healthy psychologically because the first guy that I play with uh, often, his name is Wrestle Eagle, and he was the first person that really instilled upon me don't have gear fear, but he really, he doesn't just talk the talk. He really walked the walk and he's really good at the game. So there's that. It's not just like deleting stuff and he sucks at the game and <laughs> is constantly dying. He's very quite good at the game. He's a, you know, bona fide Sherpa. But for me, he really instilled like, don't worry about the gear because you have to remember the wipe will always come. And something about that honestly made me enjoy the game even more. It was just like slow. It kind of was like a planted, like a, a seed that got planted that at first I don't think I quite understood. Like, don't really worry about your gear so much. Worry about the game, worrying about learning game sense, audio cues, et cetera. And yeah, at first I didn't really quite, didn't really, wasn't two plus two equaled four at first. And now I think it's really sunk in where it, I don't know, I can't really even articulate it. It just, it truly helped me enjoy the game more knowing that everybody was going to lose everything anyway. You know, you could even say the same about life. Like you can try to jack up your bank account in real life. You can try to acquire a bunch of stuff. You're not going to take it wherever you go, whenever you do go. So I don't want to get all like weird and, you know, metaphysical and metaphorical, but there was something about that that I thought it was really cool. 
you know, now talking more in pragmatic terms, the wipe, it's been driving me nuts because I know now that it's imminent and it's really put me personally in a very strange in limbo. Um, I can't, I just, I wish the wipe would happen like tomorrow or even yesterday. It's, it's really put a damper in my play personally because I've stopped tasking and I'm sort of like, okay, this is going to be weird. And I know at some point everybody's going to have like, if not already, like the craziest, I just feel like these next, whatever, if it's a week or if it's three weeks or a month, in my opinion, I don't think it's going to be Tarkov. I think it's going to be a little bit zany at times and very meme and very almost like a circus, if you will. I don't want to you know go too far, but I think that with the amount of loot that people are going to have and the type of guns that people are going to have, it's not, in my opinion, it's not going to feel like Tarkov to me. And I've only been, I've never gone through a wipe, but I, I'm looking forward to the wipe happening because I really am looking forward to starting again, knowing so much more about the game. And I think my sense of purpose has been a little bit or greatly diminished because I just know that it's eminent. So I'm kind of like, well, why would I task at this point? Why would I strive to do this? So, but I mean, you know, it, it's been good too. I've been, I've been running labs a lot lately just for the fun of it. Um, I've been running places like factory and customs, going to the hotspots, PVP, trying to learn, trying to use guns I normally wouldn't use with such carelessness, um, taking fights I normally wouldn't take. And I think I'm getting a lot better at PVP and my game sense has been increasing. So I'm just kind of looking at this next, you know, a few weeks before the wipe does happen as a time to, uh, to get better at the game in areas where I can. And then when the game resets, you know, the wipe happens. Um, you can always task with buddies. You can always ask buddies about this or that. But yeah, so it's been like PVP and map knowledge. And uh, it's still been, you know, it's still been a lot of fun, but I'm, I'm really looking forward to the wipe occurring, if I'm being honest. So day one after the wipe, your first login, where's your first raid? I'm probably going to go to customs and try to complete the task. I think it's kill five scavs and uh, find two MP-133 shotguns. Um, so I'm going to try to do that. I'm not looking forward to the potential 15 to 20 minute queues of going on to customs. Um, I might try to, you know, run some factory raids with a uh, trigger and see if we can farm <laughs> some gear, even though people won't have crazy gear. But um, yeah, I'm going to try to level up and task a lot more than I ever did. And especially knowing that with this quarantine, um, for the foreseeable future, I'm not going anywhere anytime soon. I'll have more time on my hands to commit so or invest in the game. So I'm gonna yeah, I'm I'm really looking forward to that. But probably customs and try to get those knock out this first uh, handful of tasks. So and I'm I'm not trying to trap you on this, and I think you know that, but if if we got word that the wipe was happening a month and a half from now and you also got word that you could start playing small shows again at the same time, would would the gamer in you cry out a little bit knowing that you wouldn't get to play at the beginning of the wipe? Or would it just be like just a pure excitement? I'll play it the next time or, or what, what would that emotion be like if, if those two things correlated side by side in terms of time after this season? Well, it's tricky. Cause I mean, if, if, if the opportunity for shows came, that would be like a flood of joy and just amazingness. So it's hard to pit that against um, the game that I'm currently playing, but I will say this doesn't answer your question necessarily, but um, about a month, month and a half ago, I found my first ever red key card on Shoreline at Resort. Um, technically, Wrestle Eagle found it and he let me take it. That's semantics. I took it, <laughs> sold it, netted probably about $49 million. And when that happened, I really was like praying to the Tar Tarkov gods. I was like, I hope the wipe occurs in like December because now I finally have the loot that I see when I turn on like Dr. Lupo or, you know, landmark or whoever. And I'm like, I really hope the wipe never happens. Cause I finally have all this money and, uh, <laughs> you know, in the game. And, um, well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I don't know. Again, like I'm, I'm trying to be optimistic and I'm trying to look at the bright side and, you know, if the wipe happens and for the foreseeable future, I'm still going to be at home and essentially quarantined. Um, yeah. it's something that is going to keep me very stimulated and, uh, you know, a great positive way to decompress or spend time when I'm not doing the things I need to be doing, like, you know, family and music and work, work stuff. So. 
Yeah. I and again, I I know how challenging of a question that is just because I know just the 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 depth of not only knowledge and experience you have but but how important music is to you but there, again there's always there's always those push pulls on things like that it's kind of like you know if if i get interrupted by my kids at night and in the middle of a game I, i'm always gonna go be with them right but that doesn't mean oh, the sure. gamer in me is like <laughs> i just walked away from a factory raid and someone's going to kill me and take all my loot. Like the gamer in me cries out for, if for the, the wipe, loot that I just walked away from. Right. If and when the wipe happens and something does impede my ability to play, I'll probably shed a tear. And I don't know what would get in the way, but I'll probably be bummed, to be honest. So hopefully it's while you're recording and it hits the keys in a way that adds <laughs> some extra rain effect to the yeah. track. That'll be perfect. I like that. Well, let me. Um, let me move into this. Um, there's there's two concepts that you've talked to me about, and again, I'm I'm gonna direct you guys again to the winner winner episode for the full novelty concept that Jeremiah opened my eyes to, but also the um, narrowing of time concept as well, and and really this is kind of a strategic concept that I want you to kind of break down on on how you learn the game and the way you break the game down. And the narrowing time concept is probably the one that is the most impactful for me where, you know, back in, and again, this is from PUBG and we've talked about it a lot in Tarkov where you're like, hey, you know, you've got 200 hours in Tarkov or 400 hours or even 3,000, the guys that play a lot but you only spend five minutes with two blacked out limbs, a bleed and a fracture and two guys trying to hunt you down. That's only going to happen this, this small amount of time. And so I guess I was hoping you would talk about that concept with how you work through those scenarios in a game that, that has the novelty concept sort of tied to it, which if if you're not familiar with the novelty concept, I'll briefly break it down here, which is it's basically like certain events only happen so often in games or in anything, but the idea would be checkers and chess. You know, checkers only has a certain number of moves, and it would be impossible now to probably have a board state that has never been seen before. But every once in a while, if you're playing chess you can get down to a board state where there's it's been seen in the digital documented history 20 times or 5 times or 200 times which would be a very small number and then every once in a while it's never been seen before and that's the novelty concept is that unique game states happen all the time and that's kind of what the battle royale game environment added to FPS and then Tarkov has some of those elements as well because of the scavs and the ai and there's nothing really pushing you to an exfil at a certain amount of time and it's not your typical three minute match that a lot of fps's have it's sometimes 40 or 55 or whatever it is and so i was hoping you could talk about how you learned this game with those two things in play in such a difficult and lack of ui type game i think this game is really interesting and once you know the game a little bit, and especially once you know the game very well, um, there's a couple of clips out there on YouTube and just in the universe of some novelty moments of this game that make you laugh and cringe at the same time. There's one that comes to mind where these guys are playing on shoreline and they kill, I think, a duo or they kill a guy. The guy goes over to loot. And the dude has a gamma container in his backpack and he gammas the gamma. And I'm just like, that's kind of a novelty moment. Like, I don't even think you can do that anymore. I don't, I don't know if you can even have the ability to put your gamma anymore in your backpack, but there's a couple of moments that just kind of make you uh, cry and laugh all at the same time. Um, with this game, it's extremely frustrating. The first even couple of months playing, at least it was for me, but not so much frustrating in the sense that, it was driving, it was actually, it's it's weird. Like even using the word frustrating is not, doesn't sum it up because I still continue to come back. If it was truly just frustrating, I would have uninstalled or never came back to it. I think for me, um, you know, it's really important, especially if you're a new Tarkov player, 
And, you know, take this with a grain of salt. Like if I was Veritas or Pastilli saying this, it might have a little bit more weight. But for me, what I try to do in my own gaming with Tarkov is like take every time, take every death, take every time you die as a gift, um, learn something from it. If, you, if you're not learning, because winning, you know, extracting, you're not really going to learn. You might learn some stuff, but, you, you, you know, arguably you might even learn more from losing. You might learn more from not extracting. You might learn more from looting the wrong stuff or dying in a way that you didn't need to die. So, you know, as much as that, and that's, that's easy to just say that. Like if you're in labs or you're in shoreline or resort or whatever, woods, and, you know, you know you're a thick boy, as they say, and you don't get out, that sucks to die. But if you can learn from that, I think that's the biggest, you know, tip I have is that, okay, well, when... You know, here's a great example. And this is something I'm still trying to get at, but this is a very specific tactic. Um, if you think somebody's in a room and you're trying to smoke them out and you throw a frag grenade in there, if somebody's in there, they're probably either going to run to the back to try to hide or they're going to push you. And I still will throw frag grenades and the guy will push me and I'll be like, oh, that guy's pushing me and then he'll kill me. <laughs> like, as if like I'm trying to smoke the person out and I don't really know if somebody's in there. And then I'll die and be like, Dude, you threw a frag grenade in there to see if somebody was in there. Then they showed themselves and you froze and you died. That's so stupid. So, okay, learn from that. That happened to me two nights ago in labs. Uh, I would open up the door to the red room. Not the, you know, I wasn't inside yet where you got to swipe the key, but, you know, the outside door. Yeah. And uh, opened it up, threw a frag grenade in, and a dude just came out immediately and smoked me with a VSS or a Val. And I was like, dude, like, your the first half of the plan that was great. You threw the grenade in there. The second half, you didn't. You know, you got to almost expect a hundred percent someone's going to rush you, or you're going to hear the footsteps of them retreating to the back. Which, you know, then you come up with a new strat. But in you know extraction uh, extraction points, it's so hard. Like even you know, I I honestly wish they had a compass or something that could help with direction. Because you know, I remember the first time I went into woods, I was like, there's it's like. There's literally, in my mind, the first time I played Woods, there was not one specific statue or one specific, like, people were like, this is Sniper Rock. This is the cliff descent. And I was like, it's literally, they're all Sniper Rocks. They're all, they're like, it's surrounded by cliff descents. Like, you know, like, even, you know, finding extractions. And I think um, just baby steps. It's all about baby steps. I think if you can learn one extraction every, you know, and, to say that you could learn one extraction per game, I think is unrealistic unless you're a very, very intelligent, bright person, because even where you spawn in relation to that extraction is going to throw it off. Um, a place like Reserve, the first you know, 50 times I played it, I had no idea where I was or what I was doing. Now I know the, the dome and you know, you play everything off the dome, at least I still do in terms of where I am. But, you know, little things like, okay, this is a this is scav lands and this is the pipe extract and this is the, uh, the sewer and you, you can't wear a bag, you know, like if you can just learn baby steps, but it's easier said than done. And, um, you know, back to what we talked about a while ago, if you can, if you can start to find guns that speak to you, chase that. I mean, if you're playing with somebody that loves a fully kitted AK and then you love the Val or you love an M4, you love the Mosin, you're just, you're like, your sniper, you love it being a sniper, whatever, I would highly suggest to chase that because I still am questioned if I'm going into labs with someone and I'm rocking an AK and they're like, oh, dude, I'm definitely using a Val. I'll be like, hey, should I use a Val too? And I know within the community, a lot of people hate the Val now. It's a big like meme. It's a big joke. But I think it's a great gun. I'm, I'm going to stick up for the Val. But I know people in the Tarkov community um, tease people that use the Val. But um, yeah, I don't know. But we're pretty firm believers that, you know, if it's in the game, use it. I think there's definitely I think there's definitely room to poke fun at stuff, but you know, we've we've debated about the Reaper scopes and, you know, the Val and, you know, certain ammo types, but I think um I think any of that can all just go to if it's in the game and it's unbalanced, typically if it's really overpowered, we'd hope they're gonna fix it, but I'm uh, ruined by the uh, the Reaper, by the way, the thermal. Like, I've been using it so much because I just have, yeah, I just have so much gear right now and cash that I never would normally have. So, yeah, I think in general, we've always said to play your game the way you want to play your game. 
And I think that holds true for basically our entire conversation tonight. There's so many different ways, whether it's the person who tells you, use this gun, you know, because I need to do this, or the person that explains it. And I do have to say, Trigger does explain it very well. Of all the people that I've played with, Trigger is very, very patient, at least with me, because, well, I'm his partner in this and he has to be. So it's be team killer, uh, Trigger. <laughs> what? I knew you were going to get it in there somewhere. <laughs> the, my like least favorite night recently was when I killed you twice. I went back and watched my VODs, your VODs, and analyzed them. Like, how oh. did I mess up so bad? You that did I turn Jared it into twice? a compliment, which was a sick. You turned it and you, you, you know, you told me, you DM'd me. Um, the reason I killed you was because you, you know, I'm not used to you moving so much, Jared, and you were playing a lot more aggressive and moving. And I was like, you know what? All is forgiven. Wait, 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 wait. When Trigger shot me, that's the same thing he said to me, Jared. I'm pretty <laughs> sure true. this is, this is, wait, wait, wait. Well, hold on. We might have uncovered something here. It's, it, it's kind of like he's telling us the same kind of deal after, you know, he shoots us both. <laughs> Um, well, first of all, I shoot things that move, so deal with it. Uh, <laughs> I was prone in labs healing with an eye pack. <laughs> so true. It's so tr- the second time. The yeah. second time. Um, no, it, it, this is really interesting to me because you guys actually both within, I would say, a 14-day window, a two-week window. And this is funny because you guys, you guys have, you, you sort of have different play styles anyway. But you both had the same sort of progression, at least playing with me. So maybe it's me. But it it went from this, like, where I'd be like, okay, hey, we're going to go up here. You hold here. And and both of you have really good game sense. And you'd be like, hey, there's somebody in this area. This is what's going on. I'm going to hold this area. Or, you know, we'd, we'd figure out where they were, and I would flank or rotate and try to flush them out, and I would see where you guys were, and this is both of you, and I'd be like, okay, that's where they are, that's where they're going to hold, I'm going to play off of that. And two weeks ago, I could expect that you would still be there or in that area, but then in the last two weeks, both of you have progressed into this like, okay, this person's there, if I flank this way, I can get a different angle. And it's it's super cool to see, but I honestly gave both of you that similar feedback because it's true. And frankly, it's not you that's having the problem. You guys are progressing, changing your gameplay, making people move and making people react versus reacting to them. And so when it was happening, I, I mean, I'm literally like, who is that? That can't be them, so I shot. <laughs> like, there's no way. No, I like that. I mean, I think for me personally, I was, it was really fun to take the back seat and just kind of have you like literally, I think, bring me gear and then be like, okay, you know what? It's time to die a lot and it's going to suck. And I'm going to be in the lobby a lot waiting for you to extract on factory. But that, I think that's like where the band aid got ripped off in a good way. It just was like, you know, I made a clear mental decision to be like, you know what? It's time to get owned a lot, Jer. And there's, you know, obviously we all go through this. There's been a couple nights where I'm like, I'm literally not playing this game ever again. Like you lose 15 raids, a couple million, if not more. And you're like, I literally suck at this game. And I felt that way about, you know, I've been tilted with music too, where I'm like, I'm so bad at music. I don't, shouldn't be doing this. And then, you know, you have a great night and you're like, all right, this is sick. (laughs) This is awesome. So. Yeah. I, and I totally uh, I appreciate Jerry your your graciousness towards Trigger. I'm still going to maintain <laughs> that the one time that we had a team kill situation, his right shoulder got in the way of my gun, so that was the, <laughs> was the problem there. That happened. You that owned same the night. guy behind me though. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Oh uh, man! All right. Well, this has been a lot of fun, but uh, we do kind of got to move it along. But before we do make it to the Xfil. We have a section of the show that we like to call the quick fire questions. So, Jer, we're going to throw some questions at you. Just whatever comes to mind right away. This is not uh, not a long answer, just a quick, short answer. And we're going to start it off with your favorite gun. RSAS with a Reaper. What's your favorite map? Customs. <clears throat> the number one thing you wish you knew before you started Tarkov. 
how to play it. <laughs> I should is not take a drink of water. Right is that an then. answer? I don't know. <laughs> how about this? What's the number one thing you know that you should be doing, but you have a hard time forcing yourself to do in Tarkov? Uh, being more confident and aggressive with PvP. And I relate to that too. What gear makes you feel invincible? Grenades. What's your most memorable Tarkov moment? Man, I don't know. That's a good question. There's been so many, and then also, like, it just all blends together. Most memorable Tarkov moment? How about, what about, what's, like, your most positive Tarkov moment that you can think of off the top of your head? Uh, most memorable Tarkov moment was the first time I was killed and my three teammates by Killa in Interchange. What's your most painful Tarkov moment? Um, every time I play Labs. <laughs> <laughs> what's your What's your favorite area to loot? Labs. If there was a system that you could remove from Tarkov, what would it be? The system, if I could remove a system, it would be the inability to click and select multiple items and drag them into a box or a crate or something like that. And if there is a system that you would add to Tarkov, what would it be? Automatic looting like items so rubles on rubles like ammo on like ammo etc and the final question is in one of your guitar show off and piano lesson streams you promised that there would be a video of you tuning and playing the altoids guitar so i want to know when that's happening oh wow put me on the spot um i <laughs> It's actually behind me on the shelf somewhere. I'm not sure where. I know it's back there. Um, I'll try it sometime. I don't know. That's a good question. I will try and tune it, and I will try to plug it into my Fender amp and see if it uh, if it even makes sound. I don't know if the piezo, the which is the thing that makes makes essentially makes the sound, collects the sound. Um, bought it from Radio Shack. It's, it's really cheap. So let me see. I mean, I built the Altoids tin guitar. It's an Altoids tin box with a. Uh, half of a, a yardstick and some guitar strings and a piece of a credit card is like the bridge. It's pretty sick. I'll try to get it out and uh, post it in one of my social medias, whether that's Instagram or Twitter. That's a good call. I- I'm not going to let it go. I'm not going to let it go. All right. I like it. <laughs> we got to make well, sure the, the thing that makes the sound makes the thing. Right. Well, that, that was it, man. We, um, before we give you this, uh, the floor here and I'm going to ask you to, Basically, let people know where they can find you, how to reach out to you, like what social media you check and and that kind of stuff. I know you're all over the place, Uh, but if you've got some content out there that you've done over this time or if they're just looking to get to know you more or watch more of some stuff you've done recently, let them know where. But I, I just wanted to say thanks, man. I mean, it was a pleasure having you on the PUBG show. It's been pretty cool that we both sort of happened to start playing Tarkov and, and we've got to play together a bit more than we were expecting in this season. Um, and then just to, again, just to have you on this show as well. So thanks for coming on, man. It's always a pleasure to sit down with you, whether we're playing games or, or talking games. I just wanted to say thank you and uh, give you a chance to promote some stuff. No, for sure, man. It's been like, likewise been a, been a blast being able to throw down Tarkov. Um, yeah, so I don't know. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Jeremiah Freights, and I'm the co-founder of the Lumineers. Started it 15 years ago. I love gaming. Uh, currently play Escape from Tarkov a lot, and I do stream probably four to five nights a week on just my personal Twitch, Jeremiah Freights. Um, just did a cool new kind of partnership with the PC company Razer, which has been very cool. I'm sure if you Google Razer and my name, there's a cool video, and it just kind of talks about... Um, kind of collaborating with them and, you know, using their amazing equipment, not only for gaming, but also for music production. And uh, yeah, I like to play Tarkov at night. It's a really fun way to decompress. And 
I also did some musical streams for the first time in the last couple of months. Um, the, the VODs are up on my personal Twitch, saved as highlights, I believe. And it's sort of some cool piano tutorials and a guitar tutorial. And, you know, I might be doing some more music streaming down the road. But uh, for now, it's been mostly games and it's been a lot of fun. That's awesome. Well, I just want to echo what Trigger said and say thanks again. Thank you, guys. This is great. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun uh, getting to know you and playing some games with you. And hanging out tonight has been uh, has been a blast. Thanks for oh, being on cool. the show. For sure. Well, make sure, everybody, that you go check out Jeremiah Freights and the Lumineers on Spotify, on iTunes. They've got some great stuff out there. And, yeah, that's pretty much it. But for us, with that green bar starting to flash, which means that we are moments away from disappearing. So I want to thank everybody for listening. Thank everybody for watching. Remember that you can find us on iTunes, Spotify, and Stitcher, as well as the hundreds of other places that podcasts are out there on the internet. And if you don't believe me, just start a podcast and you'll find out where all the podcasts are posted on the internet. As well as YouTube, go to youtube.com slash xpmedia now. You can check out the talk show version of this if you're listening to the audio only version. And if you are also interested, we've got the Xville Bootcamp videos up there right now going. So there's different topics. Triggers put together some videos. I'm putting together some other videos. Got stuff up there to help you get through this next wipe time as everyone starts over. So that all being said, we hope you all have a great week and enjoy this crazy pre-wipe time. Use all the things that you normally haven't been able to use. Don't worry about losing that gear and just run into labs and then hopefully we will shoot you. And that'll be it. So I want to say goodbye to everybody and scab often. <laughs> we'll see you guys. Thank you.